If you pick up the Bible, you don't have to read far before you meet the main character, God. Yeah, he appears in the Bible's first sentence. And then later on page one, you meet the humans. And there you have it. The two main players in the Bible, God and humans on the stage of our world. Well, not quite. In the Bible, there's actually a way bigger cast of characters than just humans and God. Like who? I mean the figures called the Elohim in the Hebrew scriptures. Angels, the Satan, demons, they're all over the story. Oh right, spiritual beings. To be honest, I've never really known what to do with them. It's all kind of weird. And unfortunately, almost all of our modern conceptions about these beings are based on serious misunderstandings. All right, so let's talk about spiritual beings in the story of the Bible. The Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first, we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. Much of what we think we know about the spirit world isn't true. It's been filtered down through centuries of church tradition. Angels do not have wings. Demons don't have horns or tails. And for the biblical writers, the unseen realm was home to more than angels and demons. There were other, bigger players. So do you believe what's in your Bible? Welcome to another episode of Ring Them Bells. Hope you guys are enjoying this series. It is blowing my mind and I'm so grateful to be able to share this information with you. I'm gonna take a second and ask you to subscribe. This is something really small for you, but it means a lot for the message and scope of this channel. If you can slap that like button, share this content out, make sure you're subscribed, turn on the alerts. All these little things help us get the message out about the good news about what God has done for this world. have to do is reorient ourselves to how the ancient biblical authors saw the world. On pages 1 and 2 of Genesis, God brings order to a watery wilderness, separating the skies above from the land below. Right, this is earth, where we live, and then there's the heavens high above, which they saw as God's domain. But in the Bible, these spaces are not separate, they overlap. And in fact, the Garden of Eden is described throughout the Bible as a high mountain garden where heaven and earth are one. Cool. So that's the world, now it needs some creatures. God first creates and appoints the sun, moon, and stars to rule the day and night. You mean the giant flaming gas balls in the sky? Well, that's how you think about them. But the biblical authors, like all ancient people, saw them as heavenly creatures that are glorious, shining bright, and high above. Which is strange. I don't think of stars as creatures. Well, you don't. But for the biblical authors, the stars formed their categories for thinking and talking about a spiritual reality that exists alongside ours. And it's a different kind of reality, just like the sky is different from the land. And it's populated with creatures that have different kinds of bodies, shiny spiritual bodies. Okay, so almost all ancient cultures thought of the stars as divine beings, including the ancient Israelites. But the biblical authors make clear that these beings are not God, rather they're images of God. Their glory and high status is a reflection of the Creator's glory and status, and they exist to serve His purposes. So the stars symbolize beings who are like God's heavenly staff team. Right. Spiritual beings are mentioned in all different parts of the Bible, and they're always depicted as subservient to Yahweh, who's the Elohim, but they're also under His command, like they do stuff. They run errands for Yahweh. Yeah. They're His staff. Yeah. Yeah which means they have some kind of delegated authority hmm. and, and influence, Yeah, right? It's played out. Right. So they can do stuff. It's only what they're allowed to do, but they can do stuff. That's uh, in terms of <clears throat> if we're playing out these yeah. scenes yeah. and their implications, what it means is that Yahweh runs the world with the staff team with delegated authority. That's right. So the question is, however, do those spiritual beings... Are they just parts of the metaphor? Right. Or does God actually seem to interact with the world 
through some kinds of mediators mm. or delegated authority figures. And as we're going to see, this doesn't seem like it's just part of a metaphor. Mm. There are lots and lots of stories and parts of the biblical story where people are interacting with Yahweh by means of a mediator. We'll have to lay the groundwork for okay. that. It's called the Divine Council. The authors so of Scripture believed the gods of the nations were real. Look at Psalm 82 carefully. God stands in the divine assembly. He administers judgment in the midst of the gods. When you really look at Psalm 82, 1, it's kind of shocking. But there it is, plain as day. God presides over an assembly of gods that he calls his sons. We're just not used to thinking of the heavenly host in those terms, but that's what the Hebrew text says. Psalm 89 says the same thing about God's counsel in the heavens. A God feared greatly in the counsel of the holy ones. The Hebrew word translated gods in Psalm 82 is Elohim. Now most of the time it should be translated as capital G, God. But sometimes it's plural. And Psalm 82, 1 has both. The problem for us is that we think this is a problem for monotheism, but it's not. We're taught to associate the letters G, O, and D with a specific set of unique attributes. That's why putting an S on the end makes us queasy. But the word Elohim is not about a set of unique attributes. The Bible itself tells us that. Elohim is simply a word used to describe a supernatural being. It says nothing, nothing about attributes. That's why the biblical writers used Elohim for other spirit beings besides God. It's used for the gods of the nations, it's used for demons, it's used for angels, uh, even the disembodied human dead. However, Yahweh is one of those Elohim and no other Elohim is like him. I repeat, no other Elohim is like him. The Bible describes him in unique ways. There is only one of him, one of him, existing as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and he is the creator of all other Elohim. Now let's go back, because after God appointed the heavenly host, he also appointed another type of creature. The humans. Yeah, in Hebrew they're called Adam, which sounds like the Hebrew word for dirt because that's what they're made of. So glorious rulers above and hairy sapiens below. But then comes the great twist. God tells the lowly humans that they are to rule all of creation. He invites them to rise above their dirty origins and share in God's glory as his partners. So God wants to rule the world through humans and not the spiritual beings. Exactly. This is how the poet of Psalm 8 understood the stories of Genesis. He looked up at the stars and says, What is humanity that you consider him? You made him lower than the spiritual beings, but crowned him with glory and divine majesty. This is humanity's high calling, to rule creation in the love and power of God. Very cool. But not everyone's happy. We're introduced to a spiritual being who doesn't want humans to rule. So he tricks them into thinking that they can get divine power on their own terms. They're deceived and they take the opportunity. So they're banished from the Eden mountain, exiled to wander the earth and return to the dust. This snake is bad news. Yeah, and as you read on, you discover that he's part of a spiritual rebellion that follows the humans outside of Eden. And things get worse from here. Remember, Yahweh, the God of Israel, is an Elohim, a spirit being. But no other Elohim is him. He is one of a kind. He is the true God with a capital G. He alone is the perfect sovereign creator. He is the most high God. Now Psalm 82, 6 says God has sons. Sons of the most high is the phrase. I have said, you are gods and sons of the most high, all of you. Who are these sons of God? It sounds odd. What about Jesus? How can there be all these other sons of God? The sons of God language made sense to ancient people. God was king, and kings assigned their sons high-ranking jobs in their government. So it is in the unseen realm. It's important because the sonship language reminds us that God wants a family. His family extends to both the unseen world and to earth and those two families come together in Eden. As I begin to 
adopt this worldview more and think about the powers and and uh, spiritual mm-hmm. beings as a modern i really want to understand them and i have this impulse mm-hmm. to want to create a taxonomy of sorts mm-hmm. and be able to mm-hmm. explain how it all works and so you've got the satan and you've got the divine council and you've got divine council gone mm-hmm. rogue and you got angels and and uh and then you got demons and how does it all fit together um, what would you what would you say to me and someone with that impulse? Like, what what do I do with that impulse? Paul would say that what comes out in the Gospels is what was always latent, and that throughout the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures, and ever since the very strange stuff that's going on, say in Genesis six with the Watchers, as they're later called, there seems to be some sort of spiritual takeover of the world, which then operates through um, the idolatry of the nations, and that when people worship these gods and goddesses, um, then they give to forces of evil, which are not in fact big bad gods, but are deeply unpleasant and damaging little demons, daimonia. That's a well-known term in the ancient world, and again, it's quite vague. They give to those creatures power over themselves, those um, strange creatures, which are, I mean, go to Colossians 1, Paul would say, God intended all the power structures in the world to serve his good creation. When humans worship bits of creation instead of God, then they give to those bits of creation a legitimacy, an apparent legitimacy, and power over them, over the humans, and over other bits of the world as well. So you have humans who want to rule on Earth on their own terms. So they start building their own nation using their own definitions of good and evil. Yeah, the famous story of the building of Babylon. But check this out. When biblical authors like Moses or Isaiah looked back at the origins of Babylon, they saw more than just a human rebellion, but also a spiritual rebellion. What was this spiritual rebellion? Well, there were members of the Divine Council who, like the humans, didn't want to represent God's authority anymore. They wanted to be God, and they rebelled. And so these created beings deceived humans into worshiping them instead of the Creator. And so Babylon becomes the biblical image for the combined human and spiritual rebellion. And so God scatters the people from Babylon into different nations. And in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses says, this is when God also scattered the rebels of the divine council with them. So the nations are handed over to spiritual rulers. Yes, and this is why when the biblical prophets look out at the violent empires of their day, they see two dimensions to all the chaos and injustice. Human rebels who are being corrupted by the worship of spiritual rebels, the idol gods of money, sex, and military power. Yeah, when humans give their allegiance to these powers, it leads to a world like ours. I think it's a perfectly good impulse to want to be able to understand, as you say, how it all fits together. Though the, the phrase how it all fits together is sort of invoking a classic machine. You know, here are the bits of my car spread out all over the garage floor. <laughs> yeah. and I want to know how to put it back together again. And uh, it may be that in the mercy of God, the way the cosmos is ordered will never present itself to us as a car waiting to be put back together. <laughs> um, in other words, we shouldn't be too disappointed if we can't instantly um, say, there you are, this goes here, you screw that bit into there, and you you solder that on there, and there, the job's done. Um, However, it does appear throughout throughout Scripture that it's partly because God is mysterious. There is no theory which will contain God. We only see who God really is when we look hard at Jesus, and that, in a sense, makes it more mysterious still. Again, it's an 18th century impulse to want to conceive God in a deist fashion as sitting in the office upstairs with all his assistants, secretaries, junior executives reporting to him and doing what they ought to. And there there is a hint of that from time to time with the pictures of the divine council at the beginning of the book of Job. And you have Jesus comes onto the scene Mm. and he's announcing the restoration of Israel and God's kingdom has arrived and a whole bunch of lesser Elohim, which the Greek word for is daimonion, Hmm. demons, lesser gods, start rearing their heads and like Jesus walks around and these beings start like springing to life, right? So you're you're saying there's a direct connection of the demons and Yes, yeah. The, The word demon is just a Greek word for lesser god. Is it? Demigod. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, Dem- demigod. Even oh. the word demi, that D E M I, is connected to the the Greek word uh, demonion. Demonion. De- demigod, lesser god. Yeah, yeah. Demon is a lesser god, a son of Elohim in Hebrew categories. But uh, specifically one. But that's specifically rebel. one that's bad. Yeah. So these daimonion, right, are like going off so the radar. So is an angel a son of God then too? Like the Michael? Mm. And... Yes, but that becomes the title that refers to, usually to ones that serve Yahweh. And ones that don't serve Yahweh, that are a part of the rebellion, are referred to in the New Testament as daimonion. Okay. And then also think about Paul's vocabulary. Paul uses this vocabulary of spiritual powers, yeah. rulers, authorities. Yeah. Where do you get all this? Right. He gets it from the Hebrew Bible right. and then mediated through a lot of this continued reflection in Jewish literature about, well, what is all this? Hmm. So everything that fits under the category of spiritual warfare comes from these biblical texts and this tradition. It was an active part of Jesus' way of viewing the world. Hmm. It was an active part of Paul's way of viewing the world. Jesus seemed to really want me to be aware that there are realities of good and of evil that I'm not aware of, that I can't sense yeah. with my five senses, but that doesn't mean they're not real and don't have some so in Christian tradition is the white hats are angels, the black hats are demons. Well, the, the, the text of scripture doesn't really conform to that. Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, when the Most High divided up the nations, when he fixed their boundaries and their borders, he fixed their number according to the number of the sons of God. Now, that's what the Dead Sea Scrolls say. It's what the new RSV says, ESV, NLT. A number of modern translations will follow the Dead Sea Scrolls. Other ones don't. They'll read sons of Israel instead of sons of God. And sons of God is the demonstrably correct reading uh, because of the Dead Sea Scroll material. If you think about the Babel event and say, well, why would God divide up the nations according to these sons of Israel? That's the traditional reading that a lot of Bibles still have. It doesn't make any sense because Israel didn't exist at the time of Babel. And so people wonder, well, what, what do we do with that? Well, the real answer is that isn't what the original text actually said. And we wouldn't really know any of that had it not been for the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Septuagint also matters a lot. What the Septuagint sort of does, because it's Greek, is the translators of the Septuagint looked at all of this vocabulary for both good guys and bad guys in the supernatural world. And they more or less made the decision that we're going to call the good guys angeloi, messengers, angels, and we're going to call the bad guys daimonion, demons. The early church was weaned, grew up on the Septuagint. And there it's all angels and demons. Dude, the rabbit hole. Okay. The rabbit hole goes deep. (laughs) First of all, the translation that I just read to you is from a number of modern translations. Okay. The King James reads differently because it's based on a a different form of the Hebrew text. Okay. King James and other translations that follow this particular Hebrew text read, when the Most High divided up the nations, he fixed the territories of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of Israel. Israel. Hmm. According to the number of the sons of Israel. Now we're just talking about Israel. Yeah. So all of this is hyperlinking back to the table of nations, the table of 70 nations in Genesis chapter 10. Hmm. So here's what seems to be happening. To say that God divided up the territories according to the numbers of the sons of Israel. How many sons of Israel? Were there? Yeah. Well, Jacob, whose name got changed to Israel, when he goes down to Egypt with his big family, we're told there were 70. He went down with 70 oh. down into Egypt. So not of his actual sons, but members of the, cl- yeah. of the clan. Correct. Members of his clan. And lo and behold, um, how many nations are numbered in, in, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 10? 10? The sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, 70. Okay. So first of all, there's an early tradition linking... And it's from a medieval Hebrew text. It's actually one of the main Hebrew texts that most English translations are based off of. Masoretic. Reads the sons of Israel. However, there are some early translations from uh, like the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Septuagint. Septuagint. Reads or translates here according to the number of the angels of God. It uses the Greek word angels of God, hmm. which is very strange. People often scratch their heads. How did 
this translator get the idea of angels of God from the sons of Israel. Uh, and then the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and there were sections of Deuteronomy discovered that did not read the word Israel. Mm -hmm. It read the word El or Elohim. Mm. It's, there's a sons fragment. of El. Yeah. yeah. So here's what almost certainly happened hmm. was that a scribe somewhere in between the period <laughs> of the Second Temple or later on got a rash <laughs> when they read this phrase that God divided up the nations according to other spiritual, the number of spiritual beings. Most Elohim. likely it was originally Israel. sons of El. Correct. Okay. Meaning right. that there's... <laughs> The, the original one we were talking about. Yeah. The, the, there's a, the every nation got its own lesser Elohim as a captain, as a mayor. Yeah. And that this depicting God. They got their God, spiritual mayor. And once again, depicting God as the head of the council. You get this one, you get that one, you yeah. get that one. Time of Augustine forward, we have demythologized, we have stripped away, we have denied that the events of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 are supernatural. We explain away the sons of God episode with, with the daughters of men. That wasn't the case, you know, for centuries, you know, since it was written on through the intertestamental period. There's a, an individual, Julius Africanus, you know, who prior to Augustine was the first one to sort of reject the supernatural worldview, but then Augustine did. And there are reasons why he did. He had an axe to grind, I think, with uh, some of the the material in Judaism and in the in the Manichees, which was the Christian sect that he joined after his conversion, that revered the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Enoch made a big deal out of this episode. And so when they had that parting of the ways, you know, Augustine is just not mindful of the need for the passage and frankly just doesn't want to hear anything about it. And so the rest of the church, because of his stature, essentially follows suit. And so ever since we've had views of Genesis 6 that make the supernatural context of it go away. So we miss number two. And number three is we know all about the story of Babel, but we never really find Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9, because prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, it would read that the nations were divided up according to the number of the sons of Israel. And the few people that asked, well, how does that make sense because there was no Israel, don't really have an answer. And so it tends to be largely ignored until we realize, again, through the Dead Sea Scrolls, that it really says sons of God there, and that takes us into this divine something going on here. I hope you guys are enjoying this series. We have so much left to explore. I just wanted to take a quick second and ask you to subscribe. This channel is growing rapidly, and I am so grateful for the reach that God is giving it. But I pray that we can go even further with the message and the good news of what God has done for this world. So please like, please share, please subscribe. Help us get the good news out there. Let's get back to the message. Bible nerds, biblical scholars, have come to refer to this category or this idea, this theme, in the Old and New Testaments as the divine council. So this theme that you're about to tell yep, us about? It's called the divine council. Okay. In other words, it's language and imagery depicting God as like a commander in chief mm -hmm. of a staff of Elohim. Yeah. Of other A king with beings. his lieutenants. Yeah. So whether it's a king, yeah, with his or yeah. general with his lieutenants or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Exactly. The divine council. Okay. And uh, there's a handful of passages that actually use this language of commander-in-chief type of situation. So um, in the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 22, there's a prophet, Micaiah, who's brought before Ahab, one of the kings of Israel. And Micaiah t tells him what the God of Israel wants to say. So he says, I had this vision. Hear the word of the Lord. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven were standing by him on his right and on his left. You get the scene here. It's Yahweh, the chief Elohim. And then there's all these other beings on flanking. What? Yeah, that's a weird translation, host of heaven. So, okay, here we go. Host of heaven. Yeah. So, you know the word heaven, skies. Yeah. So, it's the entities that populate the skies. The host, the heavenly host. Yeah, it means army. Oh, it means army. Yeah. Post means mil army. Military staff. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that English word does not help us in our Bibles. Host. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah. I don't think. The host of heaven. 
We would say the army of heaven. Army. Oh, interesting. The New International Version renders this multitudes of heaven. Okay. The host of heaven comes to us from the King James. Concretely, it's the stars. It's referring to, so the stars in most human cultures mm. that are polytheist are... We represent gods. Spiritual beings, spiritual di beings, divine beings of some kind. Venus, Mars. Yeah. But for an Israelite, Yahweh is the Elohim. Now those might represent Elohim, but they're just God's officers of his seven. Because where is God's think, biblical conception? He's above. The thing above us He's is above a solid dome. dome. Yeah. And Yahweh is above the heavens. He's yeah. in the heavens above the heavens. Mm. His throne's above it all, mm -hmm. which means that his throne is above the, the, heavenly the heavenly hosts. So they're below him. They're his subordinates. And so now we're taking that concept and turning it into a word picture <clears throat> where Yahweh is the chief. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and below him are the stars now um, by him. De depicted as standing by him as spiritual beings. Yeah. <clears throat> and the Lord said, um, I've got a mission. I need somebody to go entice Ahab to go to battle so he'll die. <laughs> So, and this is a bigger context. Ahab has been a really horrible person. He's now a murderer. Yeah, by chapter 22, he's a murderer of innocent people. And God's like, I'm done with this guy. So he's going to orchestrate Ahab's downfall. I need somebody to do that for me. One, and then look at this. One said this, another said that. This is in the story. This is what the prophet's. Over, yeah, they just over start hearing. Yeah. So one's like, ah, oh, I know. Lead him to this cliff and I'll push him <laughs> off. Or another's like, no, have him stumble and have him, whatever. Then, verse 21, a spirit, a ruach. A ruach. Yeah. Wow. Came forward and stood before Yahweh and said, I will entice him. And on goes the story. God accepts this spirit being's plan to bring about the downfall of Ahab. So is that kind of a synonym then here? Like the Ruach mm -hmm. is the heavenly yeah. host? So or is notice we have a diverse Lord? vocabulary to refer to these beings. We have Elohim, mm -hmm. and now we have Ruach, a non-physical being. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And notice it's not controversial to call these the uh, armies of heaven. It's not controversial to call them a spirit. But somehow in English, it is controversial to call that being a god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, just pointing that out. You're right. Okay. So, okay. Now, no, this story just introduces this scene. Yeah. Just like, where'd this come from? Yeah. Right? Are you with me? It's just like, whoa. Mm -hmm. Okay. God's, there's all these, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. This is exactly the same scene as the beginning of the book of Job. Yeah. So there was a day when, in this case, it's the sons of God, the sons of Elohim, came to present themselves before Yahweh and the Satan, yeah. the one among the sons of Elohim who is the, the accuser, opposer. the opposer, was among them. And then the Lord said to the opposer, ah, where were you patrolling today? <laughs> and the opposer said, well, I was going about doing my mission, just like yeah. I always do. Rome in the earth. Rome in the earth. So in this case, you have the sons of God. So these, the sons of God appear here in the beginning of Job. The first time they appear is on page six of the Bible. Oh, yeah. The sons of God yeah. see human women and have sex with them. Yeah. Whole other rabbit hole. That's in the Bible. <laughs> That's in the Bible. <laughs> Tell me about it. Genesis 6 describes the second supernatural rebellion. Some of the sons of God, members of the heavenly council, transgress the boundary between heaven and earth. The sons of God saw the daughters of humankind, that they were beautiful. The Nephilim were upon the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humankind, and they bore children to them. Both Peter and Jude reference this story in the New Testament. God did not spare the angels who sinned, but held them captive in Tartarus with chains of darkness and handed them over to be kept for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, 
Jude also tells us about the judgment of these angels. The angels who did not keep to their own domain, but deserted their proper dwelling place, he has kept in eternal bonds under deep gloom for the judgment of the great day. Both of these writers understood that Genesis 6 recorded the second supernatural rebellion. In Jewish literature, after Daniel into the second temple period, the speculation on these things just go off the charts. Yeah. There is such fascination with angels and these figures. Yeah. And there's whole books dedicated to them. It's a famous... Is Enoch about... Yeah, is, yeah is totally. About right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a collection of actually originally independent works called the Book of First Enoch, which is an amalgamation of a number of works. But yeah, it has a whole section where it names them. And how many are there? Mm. There's 70. Mm. And they all get names. And there's a chief. And they're all arranged in these hierarchies. Now, there's not 70 like people groups. No, but there is according to Genesis 10. Yeah. It's mapping on to Genesis 10. Yeah, but but once you're in like Second Temple Judaism, how do you like... Oh, I don't... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it stops. For them, it's it's all about this exegetical universe that yeah. they're living in of the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. So there's all this discussion going on. The Lord God had sent down to earth some 200 entities from his angelic entourage. Watchers, they were called, appropriately named for their divine purpose set upon by the Lord God himself. And God said to these angels, Go down to earth, oversee my mortal children, watch them and guide them from a distance, but never interfere with their affairs. Altogether, against better judgment, they descended upon the mortal women and took them for wives, impregnated them with their seed and shared with them the secrets of heaven. From the wombs of the women taken by the watchers, burst forth violent, hideous, giant beings, those that were ravenous and insatiable. They were bulbous creatures with mismatched eyes and angry snarls. Their bodies were heavyset, muscular, some with arms as big as logs and legs as firm as trunks. The fallen sons of God were sent to Tartarus for their transgression. Tartarus is a Greek word for the realm of the dead, what we think of as hell. They'd stay there until the day of the Lord, at the end of days. A term like fallen angels makes us think of demons like the ones Jesus cast out. But the rebels of Genesis 6 are imprisoned, so they can't be the demons Jesus encountered. So where did they come from? The answer lies in the offspring produced by the Forbidden Union between the sons of God and the women in Genesis 6. Those offspring were known as the Nephilim. They were giants. Their descendants became the giant clans Moses and Joshua battled. Okay, so remember the concept of God's heavenly staff team, the divine council, or the sons of God. In the Hebrew scriptures, we're told that some of these rebelled too. When did that happen? Multiple times, actually. After the snake comes the rebellion of the sons of God in Genesis 6. We're told that they have sex with women who then give birth to violent warrior giants. Oh right, the Nephilim. These are probably the strangest characters in the whole Bible. Well, strange from your point of view. But ancient readers knew exactly what was going on. The ancient kingdoms around Israel claimed to be founded and protected by giant warrior kings who were part human, part God, and filled with divine wisdom. Ah, I see. So the biblical authors are saying, hey, those warrior kings, they shouldn't be honored. Right. In this story, they're portrayed as human rebels who are captive to spiritual evil, spreading their violence in God's good world. Yeah, and one of those kings in Genesis 10 goes on to build the city of Babylon. Yes, Nimrod, whose name sounds like the Hebrew word for rebel. And his kingdom leads to the next rebellion where humans exalt themselves in Babylon. Eventually, as it turns out, all is not well among the sons of Elohim. <laughs> There's been a rebellion. But that's not what's being talked about here. Here we're just talking about the original plan. It's God designing a staff team. Yeah. Right? And for world governance. Okay, it gets even more interesting. This was actually talked about earlier on in Deuteronomy 4, where Moses said to Israel, Hey, Israel, don't act corruptly. Don't make any images for yourselves and any figures. Don't lift your eyes up to heaven and look at the sun, the moon, the stars, the armies of heaven, the host of heaven. I see and be drawn away and worship and serve them, those which 
Yahweh your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. God set it up and those lesser Elohim are for governing those other peoples. But Yahweh has taken you to be his own possession. It's the same idea. Yeah. Just in a different biblical passage. Just in case you're wondering like, what? This is just one biblical mm. passage. No, it's actually a theme in Deuteronomy. Mm. That yeah, Israel is Yahweh's special people. The other people worship other gods. And even that is itself by God's allowance. But what's gone wrong as the biblical as this theme develops is that those other gods weren't satisfied with delegated authority. They wanted more for themselves. <clears throat> Here's uh, Jeffrey Tigay, his commentary on Deuteronomy. He's talking about these passages in Deuteronomy. He says, these passages refer to an early tradition about God allotting the nations to the delegated authority of other divine beings. And he made that the same number of nations and territories as there were such beings. However, verse 9 implies, and he's referring back to the statement of he fixed the territories according to the number of the sons of God, states explicitly then that he kept Israel for himself, but mm -hmm. Yahweh's portion was his people. Mm -hmm. This seems to be part of a concept hinted at elsewhere in the Bible and in later Jewish literature. When God organized the government of the world, there were two tiers. At the top, there's Yahweh, God of gods, and Lord of lords. He reserved Israel for himself to govern personally. But below him were 70 angelic sons of Elohim, to whom he allotted the other peoples. The conception is like that of a king or an emperor governing a capital or heartland of his realm and then assigning the provinces to different subordinates. So that's the setup. That's the conception here. Yeah. However, if you go back to, think, think back, where is, what is 70 coming? This is a hyperlink mm. back to the 70 nations yeah. of Genesis 10. Yeah. What's the next story in Tower the book of, of Genesis? Or, yes, yeah. Tower of yeah, the rebellion at Babylon. Yeah. And the scattering of the, of nation. the nations yeah. at Babylon. So what's happening here actually is hyperlinking back to something odd going on in those stories. Because Genesis 10 gives you 70, right? 70 nations. Mm -hmm. And they're all organized and it says each according to their own language. And right. then Genesis 11 comes along and says, they're now all the everyone, language. right? The whole land had one language. You're like, wait, no, yeah. they don't. <laughs> so the stories have been intentionally put out of chronological order. Uh -huh. So Genesis 10 gives you the 70. And then you're like, well, how do they all, where yeah. did all those languages come from? Let me tell you. Let me tell you. And then it's the story of humans. They come together and they don't want to be scattered. They want to come together and they want to build a temple yeah. to exalt themselves mm -hmm. to the place of God. As all these hyperlinks are saying, there was a human rebellion happening at Babylon. And then you read on to the Torah and you realize there was also a rebellion among the host of heaven that that human rebellion matched a rebellion among the host of heaven. Separate. The conflict in the heavens among the heavenly staff team maps on to the misfortunes of humans, right? Because they're governing. Yeah. And so the misfortunes of humans is itself a window of the consequences of the heavenly rebellion. And the heavenly rebellion is connected to the human rebellion. Mm. Just so you know, we're not just making this up out of all these different stories, when you get to the book of Daniel, mm. the book of Daniel is tracking with all of this. Mm. So you have Daniel, who's sitting in Babylon as an exile and prisoner, Jerusalem smoldering, and he's praying to Yahweh to bring comfort and restoration to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And he sits and prays for a while. And then eventually, a holy one comes to him. And the Holy One is it's one of these Elohim, okay. sons of Elohim, uh -huh. uh, except called a, a Holy One. Mm -hmm. And this being gives their name, Gabriel, which means God is my warrior. And he says this. He says, listen, we heard your prayer. We were coming your way. But then the prince of Persia was resisting us for 21 days. It yeah. took us three weeks to get here. Because there was that other Elohim, the one assigned to Persia. He was resisting us. And so he got in our way. But finally, we made it to you. 
because Michael, who is like El, who is like God, um, he who came. Who is like God? That's what his name means. Michael means who is like El, who hmm. is like God. Michael came and he helped me. I was able to get away from the king of Persia, so now I'm here to answer your prayer. Jeez. That's the story. Uh, no, but in other words, do you see how that story is itself a reflection on, a reflection that. on all of this earlier stuff yeah. about lesser Elohim assigned, there's yeah. been a rebellion, yeah. now the battles on earth, yeah. Persia against Babylon, reflect these heavenly conflicts. So demons are spiritual forces at work behind corrupt human power structures. Yes, but in the Bible, they also work on the personal level, animating and exploiting humanity's greed and selfishness, as well as the weakness of our mortal bodies. In the Bible, spiritual evil is at work in anything that drags God's good creation back into chaos, darkness, and death. So this is why when Jesus arrives on the scene, he said his primary enemy is not human. Right. Jesus and his first followers viewed all the pain and suffering in God's good world as a sign of its captivity to death and spiritual evil. But they didn't think this was the end of the story. Right. Jesus knew that the only way out of this cosmic ruin is to overcome evil and death itself, even if it costs him everything. Do you think that the courtroom structure of the heavenly realm that is portrayed in Job, mm. uh, and it shows up elsewhere in the Bible, is that merely an idea from culture, or is it, uh, or of the biblical writers, or mm. is that a reflection of, of true reality of what the heavenly realms are like? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exa that's exactly right. That is exactly the question. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, the divine court uh, scene uh, uh, appears in all, all different parts of the Bible, in, in the Torah, in the prophets, in the Psalms, um, in Job, um, and it appears uh, in the New Testament as well, um, in John the visionary in the Revelation. Um, John sees the heavenly throne room and with the creatures and so on. So here's something that's really interesting is that all of the imagery in all of those different passages uh, has strong parallels to depictions of um, the divine realm in the cultures of Israel's neighbors, of uh, divine court rooms, of divine courtiers or spiritual beings um, that look very similar to what the cherubim are described is looking at. Actually, if you, you could just Google, like, um, you know, the modern, in modern day Iraq, they have this, you know, this big build out of how they restored a part of ancient Babylon. And these guardian creatures um, that the kings of Babylon placed at the gates were these multiform animal winged creatures with human faces and so on. They're really, they're called the Lamassu statues. They're really cool looking. And they're like, they look almost exactly like what cherubim looked like as they're described in the Bible. So this is interesting, is that the biblical authors used the imaginative framework that they had, and when they encountered the divine realm, that's what they saw and experienced. And that used to bother me, um, and I guess it, maybe it still does a little bit, um, but one other thing that became really noticeable to me was that every time that this divine court is described, in all of these different visions and scenes throughout Scripture, Old and New Testaments, it's always a little bit different. The creatures look different. Sometimes they have two wings. Sometimes they have four. Sometimes they have six. Sometimes they're glowing. Sometimes they're on fire. Sometimes they're smoking. Uh, and, and so, like, it's... I think what, um, what we're up against here is the fact that God has chosen to communicate through humans. Like, the Scriptures are the products of people. Um, and the Bible is, like, not bashful about this fact. It actually tells us about the writing of many of the scrolls by people in the, in the books themselves. And so, um, in, in a way, the question is, is similar to the fact is, does God speak Aramaic? Well, Jesus of Nazareth spoke Aramaic. Does that mean that God speaks Aramaic? Well, no, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Are you with me? 
It's actually just a different version of the same question. Every time that God is going to interface with humans, it's going to be in the form of human language, imagination, and cultural expression. And what that doesn't mean is that Isaiah or John, the visionary, didn't actually encounter something. But the thing that he encountered was interpreted by his brain, given the cultural and imaginative framework that, that he had. And the same is, is true for me. And that doesn't mean it's not real. If anything, what we're trying to say is whatever the presence of God is, it's more real than anything you could ever imagine. It, and it can only be captured in human words and imagination, given the fact that, you know, I'm not God, and so I'm going to describe it with the language and categories that I have. I'm sorry, this is a really big question. Um, but, uh, but to me, uh, the, uh, the divine court scenes in the Bible raised this question for me a long, long, long time ago, and so I care about it. And I think it's an important one because it really forces us to reckon with the nature of the Bible as a product of both divine and human initiatives partnered together. And how much of that the ancient Israelites themselves saw in terms of, of what we today would call metaphor or myth, uh, it's a manner of speaking, and how much they saw it in terms of an actual spiritual reality. I suspect it's a bit of both, that they will have, see, have seen the God of Israel as, well, as they, they regularly refer to the God of Israel as Yahweh Tzavah, um, the, the Yahweh of hosts. In other words, he's, Yahweh is the commander of a vast army of angels and archangels who are constantly on the move doing his bidding and, and serving him and worshipping him. But we don't get to see too much of that. It creeps out from time to time and we suddenly realize that that was going on, like that scene in, in the second book of Kings where Elisha's servant is, is panicking because they're surrounded by an army and Elisha just says, um, Lord, open his eyes, will you? And he looks <laughs> and, of course, the mountain is and chariots of fire around about the prophet. Um, and in fact, we're quite safe. We are, we are surrounded by um, the Lord's army. Those things stand out by their rarity. We are not normally given to see that. Mm -hmm. And part of the joy of the so-called apocalyptic books like Daniel and so on is that from time to time there are flickers where, oh my goodness, the curtain's been drawn back and we can see what's really going on here. Um, but mostly we don't. And part of the function of the Gospels, I think, within the inspiration of Scripture, is that the Gospels are meant to draw back the curtain so that we say, oh my goodness, this is the heart of what was going on. This was the battle that was being fought all along, and this is the battle whose mopping up operations we are now involved with. But for most of the time, the veil is back on, and we just have to live by faith and assume that there are battles of all sorts being waged, and that we are junior members in that, and that from time to time we will see um, that, that there is uh, something which has to be done which may be very difficult and will require a lot of prayer and fasting and, and so on. Romans 15, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, okay, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. And in order, and you, you have the Jews in one audience, but the other audience is the Gentiles, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let the peoples extol him. So here, again, he links the resurrection with Gentile ministry, not just Jews, but Gentile ministry. Now, what's going on here? If you look at Romans 15, the end of it, verse 12, Paul tacks on one other verse. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. Now, the, the root of Jesse, this is messianic language, the branch, okay, the Old Testament would, would have, or root, or the stump. Uh, interestingly enough, just sidebar, isn't it interesting that for the king, for the Messiah, here once again we have tree, i.e. garden imagery. 
gate used of the Messianic King. But again, that's a sidebar. We spent a lot of time on cosmic gardens and all that stuff. But here we have the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. Now what's interesting here is if we turn our interlinear on, arises is the verb anistemi. It means to rise up, okay? There's another word used for the same thing um, that means again to rise up. Both of them are used for the resurrection, but anistemi is one that's noteworthy because the noun form of this is anastasis, which is the New Testament word for resurrection. That's anastasis, resurrection. And what's kind of cool is if we go to, I don't know if I have it open, but I'm gonna open it here. If we go to the Septuagint, I'm gonna show you the English Septuagint here, English translation. Septuagint in Greek. And if I remember my Septuagint numbering correctly, Septuagint Psalm 82 is not 82, it's 81. Septuagint has different numbering. We read here, again, this is Psalm 82. God assembled, you know, in, in the divine assembly with the gods. He's gonna judge the gods. He rails on them for the chaos they sow in their nations. He says, I said, you're gods, you're all children of the most high. Again, most high is the term used in Deuteronomy 32 for the you know, divorce of the nations. But now you're gonna die as humans and as one of the rulers, you're gonna fall. Stand up, O God, the psalmist says, rise up, judge the earth because you will inherit all the nations. Guess what? It's the same verb as this one. Okay, Paul links Jesus' resurrection, okay, resurrection specifically to rule of the Gentiles. He knows his Old Testament. They're, they're again, under foreign supernatural domination. The gods over here have to be dealt with and they are dealt with by the resurrection. Again, there, is, there are several passages like this in the Old Testament in the Septuagint where the verb and the noun of resurrection is linked to the rule of Gentile territory. This is why Paul, Again, Paul knows his Old Testament really well. This is why Paul, when he thinks of resurrection and he thinks of ascension, he associates it up here mentally and theologically as being the key to diminishing, to stripping away Colossians 2, to stripping away the authority, disarming the rulers, the principalities and powers over the nations, and ultimately, Ultimately, as the kingdom progresses, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. A couple clicks back here. Ultimately, it's not going to be just disarming. When the Great Commission is accomplished, okay, when basically all the people are gathered, then comes the end, and he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, then they, he's going to destroy them. He's going to destroy them. It's no longer disarming, it's destroying. Now, I often get, get asked, you know, in talk shows or interviews or whatever about spiritual warfare and how does, how does all this factor into spiritual warfare. The first thing we have to realize is that Paul's ministry was a tough one. Just because Paul believed on the basis of Scripture and the basis of the reality of the resurrection and the ascension, that the authority of the supernatural powers of darkness in all these places, these Gentile dominions, just because he believed that their authority had been taken away doesn't mean they're leaving. Okay, they're going to fight for their turf. They're going to do all they can to blind the people who live under their charge to the gospel. They don't want to lose their worship. They enjoy enslaving their populations. They hate Yahweh. They hate God's people. The last thing they want is, is to lose their own subjects to the real king. Okay, they're going to continue to fight. This is why Paul talks about spiritual warfare. Okay, we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers, you know, in the, in the heavenlies. Okay, it is a conflict. They're not dead yet. They're not destroyed yet. They will be, and they know it because of Psalm 82 and other passages. They know that. But Paul, again, has linked 
the coming of the kingdom and with it the day of the Lord in the end and the destruction of these supernatural beings. He's linked it in Romans. We just read the passage to something called the fullness of the Gentiles. When the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in, then Israel will awaken and they'll, you know, all Israel will be saved. And that needs to happen too. That needs to happen too. So do you see what that means? Paul, in his, you know, again, biblical theology, links the success of the Great Commission to the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord, and the destruction, the final destruction of all the cosmic powers. So when I, when I get asked, what is spiritual warfare? Okay, it's not shouting at demons. Okay, it's not, you know, these, these confrontational things that we think of with spiritual warfare, you know, spooky stuff, like we're ghostbusters or something, okay? It's not that. I mean, I've talked to plenty of missionaries and they have those episodes and, and people over here too, they have these episodes. They're real and it could happen, but that is not the ultimate end game. It's not even the ultimate battle. It's not really even what it's about. What it's about, you just ask yourself a simple question. What do, if the principalities and powers and the rulers, the powers of darkness, if they, if they know this stuff, and by now they do because, you know, it, it's out in the open. What do they fear? What do they fear? They fear their own destruction, which means they fear the success of the Great Commission. Okay. Their game plan, you know, do they think they can win? Well, of course they don't, they don't think they can beat the Most High. They don't think they're gonna kill him off because they're not idiots, all right? But what they do believe, what they do know, is that the longer we kick the Great Commission can down the road, as long, the, the longer we blind people to the gospel, the longer it takes to reach whatever point this is, and only God knows when the fullness of the Gentiles is accomplished and Israel awakens, the longer we can keep that in the future, we survive. That's the game plan. That, that's how they are gonna define victory. We're still here. And this is spiritual warfare. It is, it is focused on the Great Commission. So what I try to advise people is, look, I know spiritual warfare sounds sexy. Again, it be, and it's because of the way it's sort of been Hollywoodized and, and whatnot. And, and like, like, like it, would be, it would just be the, the highlight of our day to get into a conflict with a demon, okay? What the highlight of your day ought to be is winning somebody to the Lord, okay? Because that is what they fear. They don't fear getting kicked out of a room or, you know, I got to go possess somebody now else, you know. No, what they fear is their own destruction. And the only thing that's going to lead to that is the success of the Great Commission. That is biblical theology. Get this right and the entire picture from first creation to the new heavens and new earth is held in place. Get it wrong, and you might just end up with Plato denying the goodness of the present universe and seeking to escape it. But I, I think when we get it right, we see the cross itself as a sign. I think Athanasius was sitting, hinting at this, of the joining together of heaven and earth, like the tabernacle in the wilderness. The cross is a strange place where instead of the pillar of cloud and fire, we now have the bruised and bleeding body of Israel's Messiah. And one of the reasons why this symbol is so powerful, as we saw at the start, is because it says visually, in a radical new way, what the temple had always been about. This is where heaven and earth are held together, only now in the self-giving love of heaven for the undeserving earth. And because the victory of love we see on the cross is so central and vital, we shouldn't be surprised that it's been distorted in thought and in practice. The power of this divine love is the most powerful force in all creation, and all the other powers of the world are eager to distort or misrepresent it or turn it aside. And our task as faithful and careful students of Scripture is continually to search the Scriptures, to see what it really means that the Messiah died and rose again in a accordance with those same scriptures. 
My friends, this is an exciting time to be working on scripture, not just because it carries its own beauty and delight, though it does, but because this message of God's victory over evil through the representative substitution of Jesus the Messiah remains the single power through which the warring nations of the world can be held to account and the hard bitterness of human hearts can be softened. He loved me, said Paul, and gave himself for me. Hang on to that, and victory is ours. Blame on you at all. It's as though the prosecutor has been thrown out of court. God doesn't need to hear what you've done. He doesn't need to hear why you deserve death. He doesn't need to hear that death is your destiny. If you embrace me as Messiah, and you join the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, problem solved. He has no claim on you at all. And so this, my ministry, my message, is the beginning of him losing ownership of the world. This is where it begins. What spiritual warfare is, is the growth of the kingdom of God, the Great Commission, and the diminishing of the other kingdom. And the way that's accomplished is telling truth. You speak truth to lies. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful ministry of the, the great bell ringing out, the bell of freedom, the bell which rings out uh, day by day, night by night, to say it is time for God's kingdom. It's kingdom time. And we want that bell to go on ringing louder and louder, gracious Lord. We want people to know that you are Lord, Lord of the whole world. We pray for those we've discussed, people in the military industrial complex, presidents and prime ministers and people who have to agonize over difficult decisions of foreign policy, domestic policy. We pray that you will raise up a new generation of wise, godly, prayerful, uh, well-taught Christian leaders who will get into the bloodstream of the nations of the world and teach us a fresh wisdom so that we won't just always be going around the same circles and cycles of violence. But we pray for a world in which your love and your kingdom will once again be honored and people will come looking for it and uh, come to the foot of the cross to find it there. So we pray for the ministry of this uh, ringing the bells whole sequence and we pray for the, the work of your gospel in the world. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.